Welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Great. It's great to be back, Tom. It's weird to be with you in person with our masks off. I know. It's nice. It's really nice. It's really good to see you, and it's nice to chat with no mask at a safe distance, but still like the normal distance. We wouldn't be. Um... I tend to do interviews closer than this. <laughs> I try to get as you know, I try, I try nice on close talking. Yeah, <laughs> two inches between I find is the is the safe space. Uh, yeah, I, and I should point out that we're we're vaccinated and and That's and, right. and and tested and all that. And so I want to talk to you about this record. Um, and normally when you when you come in with a record, you have some sort of big idea. Yeah. What what is it? Yeah. So with this album, the thing that inspired me was another big idea it's not um my last album was like a concept album more narrative this one isn't that but it was still inspired by a big ethereal kind of image um that occurred to me one day and the image was of a let's begin with a circle it started with a circle if you can imagine just a two-dimensional regular circle like a circle you draw on a piece of paper like a circle you draw on a piece of paper and then i saw this circle become fragmented into seven, eight different pieces. And then those seven, eight different pieces starting to float away from each other and disintegrate. And um, I was thinking about this image or this image occurred to me in the context of just thinking about our lives, our individual lives, and the way we conceive of ourselves and our lives as, as consisting of different parts. Let's say your work life, your family life, your relationship to nature, all these different aspects of our life. And it, it kind of like occurred to me that um, this is maybe a accurate image or metaphor for what's happening to us. Basically, um, all of these different aspects of who we are, to me, it feels like they're under threat, um, under threat of sort of disappearing. By, by who? So, uh, by various forces. So let's take work, for example, right? As, as we all know, work has become um, more scarce, more precarious, and um, also more divorced from purpose, meaning, community, you know? Like, people often will work for a multinational corporation that's based here, then they're doing accounts payable or whatever, and the company is doing something else, God knows what, in some other corner of the world. And so people, um, a lot of times in their work life, live with this sort of confusion or this sense of disorientation, like, what exactly am I doing? What exactly am I contributing to in the world? So um, so just as one, one of those yeah. fragments of the circle, um, to give you an example. So what is, um, what is it threatened by? some powerful forces, I yeah. guess. You know, I, at that point, I think we're getting into what I like to get into with my music, which is like the spiritual. You yeah. know, it's threatened by our fear of death. It's threatened by greed. It's threatened by pride. It's threatened by all the isms that we often talk about, you know? Um, so that would be my best answer to that. I tell you, and I, and I want to talk about one of those forces in particular that, that's been on my mind. But before I do, I think it would be fair for someone who's listening to this to think, oh, very good. You know, Shad went through the pandemic <laughs> and, and we have been, you know, like we have been disengaged from community because we're in our houses. We have been disengaged from work because we're working from home. We have been disengaged from relationships because we can't meet up with people in the street. We have been, I mean, speaking personally, yeah. we have been uh, away from our families because we're away from our families. But this was all pre-pandemic. Yeah, this is very much pre-pandemic. Um, there's, a, you know, Stephen Marsh, a um, writer. Yeah. There's something that he wrote early in the pandemic where he was talking about how all these things you've just talked about that sound like pandemic things, they're actually what was already happening, and the pandemic just kind of, like, hit the gas pedal on them, accelerated them to, like, some some pretty wild extremes. Polarization. Yeah, the, 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 exactly, the polarization, what's, what's been happening to work, what's been happening with inequality. You know, the pandemic really accelerated a trend that was already happening. So I think that's why it still makes sense or feels like it makes even more sense or feels like it's super on the nose given the pandemic. But yeah, absolutely. I, I wrote this and recorded most of it before the pandemic. Um, because it was already there. All this stuff was already very much there. Well, uh, we asked you to pick out some music for us from the record that maybe we could talk about. So do you want to play something? Take a listen to this.
sad and out of touch now. Yeah. Tell me about that song. That song I wrote to be the first song on the album and basically the thesis statement for the album. That's how I thought about that song and how I approached writing it. So I'm touching on all kinds of things in the lyrics, everything we've been discussing, all these different um, ways that we're disconnected from ourselves, dis disconnected from each other. Um, but as always, it's music. So it should feel like something you actually want to listen to. <laughs> so that's what I tried to do with that song is, is, is make it say what I'm trying to say, but also make it, um, make it the kind of music that I love, which has a spark to it, which has a sense of, uh, of excitement to it. What happens if the circle gets broken up? I don't know. Yeah. So I see a couple different possibilities. And what I liked about working on this album is I didn't have the answer to that question. Um, and I was hoping to maybe stumble upon it as I wrote and recorded, but I didn't get to the end. I have a couple of different ideas, Tom. Maybe we're supposed to try to put it back together. That's one idea. Or maybe this is the cycle of things and they die. And then if they die well, new life emerges on the other side. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if we're, we're supposed to try to put it back together or if we're supposed to um, help it die well. I, I got to tell know. you, I mean, I, I, that's, what I, that's what I think about when it comes to, I know one of the things you talk about this record and you and I have texted about is technology you know, and particularly social media. And I'm sort of, go, I was talking to someone about this the other day that I sort of go back and forth on it because I do, I hate myself on my phone. I hate myself when I look at my phone. I know there's a correlation between, and there is a correlation between my self-esteem and my self good, good feeling and yes. looking at my phone, yet I can't stop looking at my phone and also i don't want to be a guy i mean when the printing press came out i don't want to be someone i wouldn't want to be that guy who's like oh no no printing press bad idea let's keep saying things to one another you know what i mean like yes, i don't i don't yes. want to be that guy either yes how are yes. you thinking about technology on this record well look that's really interesting because <laughs> i think we should look at the printing press for a second right um The written word, it, it's changed so much. Think about how much we um, privilege the written word, especially now even on social media mm -hmm. and on the internet. And we don't care about context. We don't care about body language. It's just what exactly do the words say? You know, we, we've also texted about like religious interpretations and how much that is so hyper-focused on the text as opposed to something embodied um, as, it, as it was maybe as it's maybe best explained, you know, mm -hmm. um, and understood. So I think all that to say, I think we should look at all these new technologies uh, critically, but, you know, and not in a way of saying it's all bad mm -hmm. because it's new, but as a way of saying, hey, let's actually look at what's good and what's bad. Facebook started in, what, 2003? Mm -hmm. It's not even 20 years ago. Why not have a 20th anniversary uh, government, um, I don't know what you call it, where you review stuff. Party. <laughs> Party, <laughs> where you review, you know, how has this affected yeah. um, people's well-being, yeah. people's, uh, our discourse, political discourse, our diff different industries, like the media industry. Mm -hmm. Is this good? Is this bad? In what ways is it good? In what ways is it bad? I don't... It's it's hard, Tom. It's hard to approach uh, to to figure out how to approach it. But there's definitely on this album a thread of about technology, um, because it's so. I don't think it can be understated the shifts that we've undergone in the last 20, 25 years. How are you with it? How, how are you hooked on your phone or? I'm hooked on my phone like everybody is hooked on their phone. Um, but I do. I'm old enough that I fortunately that I come from the old world, so. I can kind of evaluate based on my own experiences, like what were things like before, what are things like now? And also I came into it 
fundamentally with this idea of this is an add-on to my life. This yeah. isn't my yeah. life, right? Yeah. I think both of us are, you know, in that similar kind of age range where that's how we look at it. That's how we started looking at it. Yeah. And so that gives us a an opportunity to 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 evaluate it that way. Um But we're human beings, we adapt and we become accustomed to things fast. So I think we have to take a look sooner than later and decide sooner than later. Decide is a word that keeps coming to my mind in the last year or so. Like, I think we can't continue to let the forces take us where they take us. We have to make some sort of decision about what we want, what we think is good about life. Um, what we think a human being is and should be. How, what, what community, whether community is valued to us yeah. and how do we achieve it? How do we achieve it? You know, um, but, that, but those are like yeah. collective decisions those that, are, those are, that, are, that are hard to make. Yeah. And I, and I would argue, and I, 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 we're going down, I love it. We're going down it, but we're going down. I would argue that this technology actually stops us from being able to make these decisions yeah. intentionally. But, um, what we can do are individual decisions and individual choices, including, I know if you don't, we can talk, we, we don't have to talk about it, but I know you have a couple of youngsters now. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. And you are currently in control of their technology. <laughs> yes. Uh, intake. So that's a personal choice you can make. It is, but I, I do think, um, how's that going? It's going good yeah. because they're still young. And so it's easy. I can tell my three-year-old, oh, yeah, I, I only have three videos on my phone. These two Daniel Tiger songs and this one Moana song, and that's it. And Mind so, it is the truth. And Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's easy. I can lie very easily now. <laughs> but what I would love for them is if they were a part of a community ethic around technology because I just believe in that. And I hope the album even feels like that, feels like it's suggesting that we need each other, you know? Um, because yes, we can make individual decisions, but I just don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is in us together somehow. So um, that's what I hope for for them. Right now, I feel like I'm in a good place because it's still easy. You have, a great, you have a great gift for that, you know? I remember, it might've been last summer or at some point, I remember uh, I, you were on social media and you said something along the lines of, Hey, this is great. I'm glad we're all talking. Don't forget that we're talking on platforms owned by billionaires. Yeah. We're, we're owned by, we're talking on platforms with a reach, with a power that is even difficult to con conceive, you know, it's even difficult to grasp and how they even function because of algorithms. It's like even the people that make the algorithms don't know how they function at a certain point. So it's all extremely opaque. It's all, wow, mitigated by extremely, extremely powerful um, corporations that are, of course, invested in us just engaging more on those platforms. That's their, you know, that's what they want. That's how they make a profit. Um, so yeah, we can't, we can't forget that. Um, and we, again, not to say that they're all horrible, but to say that we have to decide how they can work best for us, how they can serve humanity. Um, because they won't just serve humanity otherwise. Like we, we have to make that decision. Want to hear another song? Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. Work. 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 Looking for a job, man. Looking for a job, man. They say that even Steve Jobs can't find a machine that I could be a cog in. This is a problem. I'm trying to leave it in God's hands. God's plan. But even God's fam was literally out on a limb. Like, oh, God. Looking for a job, man. Looking for a job. 
peace. Maybe I'll sleep when I'm deceased. Maybe it'll cease when I'm asleep. Maybe I should keep what I can keep. Talk is cheap. That's my guest, Chad. We're talking about his new album, Tao. That's a song called Work Slow. <laughs> I like that. I like, I like that song a lot. Thank you. Where did that one come from in you? Work was definitely a song I want to make when I was thinking about this album. So, um, again, it started with that big image as my inspiration, my kind of North Star. But um, this, I'm going to catch people up. It's sorry, the, yes. the circle with the um yeah. with, with the various pieces our community our relationship to land yeah our relationship to one another relationship to our family yeah. all uh dividing away from the circle like a pie chart being that's broken right. up that's right yes as a metaphor for kind of what's happening to our selves our humanity right and, um and so i knew one of the things i wanted to uh, make a song about was work uh, as one of those aspects of who we are one of those pieces of the circle and an unfortunately outsized one in my opinion um, and I knew I wanted to talk about two things uh, as it related to work. One being just how work has become more scarce, more precarious, and the anxiety around that, um, and the very real consequences of that. And secondly, I wanted to talk about um, work and meaning, um, and the way that so few people get to experience this sort of peace that comes from just, this is what I do, and this is how it serves my community. Um, so the way I sum it up is kind of like how, how people have become disconnected from work and how work has become disconnected from humanity, um, if that makes sense, if that's an easier way to think about it. So, yeah, so um, you, worked on... So you did it in a very personal way Yeah. on this song, if you don't mind me saying so. Yeah, I, I well, stuff's more resonant, first of all, in first person. You got to... You gotta, to me, it's like, it's part of the fun, the creative challenge of music. How do you make it feel like something, you know? And so, yeah, I put it, I put it in first, in first person and, and injected some of my own, you know, life experience into that. Um, How does that so, feel? I love it. Like, if there's no stakes in your music, I think people can tell and it just doesn't feel like anything. That's, some, that's one of the main things I'm listening for when I'm working on a song is, uh, it's not really is it, I'm listening for if it's good or not, but that's secondary. The first thing is like, does this feel like something? Does it feel like there's urgency, like there's stakes in it? And so what, what I like that, Tom. I like that if there's not a little bit of fear or something that feels like fear, then it's probably not worth putting out there. Where, where, where was the fear in this song for you? Um, a, f a few things. Um, maybe I wouldn't use the word fear, but risk. So yeah. even musically, um, this is very different yeah. sound for me. So it's like, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it, kind of punk and also kind of 80s hip hop yeah. together, a bit of industrial yeah. kind of sound. So very different. Wasn't sure if that's going to work out. Um, the way I'm using my voice is very different. And then, yeah, it's this sort of like first person sort of self-deprecating tune, you know, as I'm putting myself into the story of what's happening in, in terms of work um, in our society. So all of those things felt made it feel like, okay, there's something happening here that's exciting in this song. What I love about all of this is that... Um, in no way at any part of this record, which is, is, is truly um, a testament to what we lose when we lose community, what we lose when we lose communion, at no point is it a bummer. Good. <laughs> well, you, do you know what I mean by that? No, I'm glad. I'm glad, because that's always a risk with, some, with something like this. But it's very yeah. intentional, Shad. Yeah. It's very intentional on your part. It's, it, it has to be an artistic challenge to speak about issues issues to speak yeah. about us to speak about the world and your thoughts on it about surveillance capitalism about uh you know the social media companies um but also get people to dance to it yeah that's the fun for me i like that creative challenge of how to make it feel exciting and fun like i love i love humor i love putting humor in my work um 
I love that. I love that challenge. And actually the thing too, like everything we're talking about is like, is so heady and everything. But what I liked about using this metaphor of the circle breaking into pieces as my inspiration is that each of those pieces, if I think about each of those pieces as a song, writing to each of those pieces, it, it also is much more digestible, right? I'm not trying to explain that whole metaphor in a song. I'm saying, let's look at work. And then let's look at nature. And then let's look at, you know. Let's look at God. Let's, let's look, look at God. Family, let's yeah. look at, yeah. you know, our connection to each other. So it also, that was another way for me of trying to make it more musical and digestible and fun and not a bummer. <laughs> was breaking it off into one piece at a time. Listen, if, you, if, that, if, that's, if that's the quote you need for it, I, I'm happy to provide it. <laughs> I will slap that on the LP. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about hip hop evolution for a second? Of course. Um, I heard you say something, I think it might have been through a producer like that, that I wanted to talk to you about in terms of technology. Last time you were on, I, I think I asked you the question, I think you get asked a lot, which is like, you know, what have you learned when you, when you sit down and talk to people like, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, legendary hip hop artists, what do you take from them in your own career? Very reasonable question, by the way, yes. and a solid one. Uh, thank you, if I do say so myself. <laughs> but I love this sort of new revelation you had that I hope you can explain where it came from in you that hip hop should be looked at from a technological perspective yeah. as well as an artistic one. Yeah. So like you said, it is a very fair question uh, that I get asked all the time. You know, what did you learn when you made the show or how did it affect how you make your music? And uh, the answer is something that ended up surprising me, you know, as I, as I went through all these interviews because it wasn't as simple as, oh, I heard... Um, Snoop say this about how he made doggy style, and so then I did it. You know, it wasn't that simple. Um, it was more like I learned a lot about culture and how culture works. And I learned a lot about technology and how central technology is to music and how uh, central it is especially to hip-hop music. Hip-hop started with turntables. And that is, you know, a piece of technology that, that some kids some brilliant kids figured out how to use in ways that no one had thought of before. And then the music evolved as the technology evolved. And that, you can trace that. Our show really follows um, geographically how the music evolved when it went to different places. The New York culture went to different, interacted with other local cultures. But it's also very much the story of how technology changed and then the music changed. You had the 808 drum machine coming in. Okay, well that changes everything. And then you have sampling machines. And then you have better sampling machines that can hold more sampling time. And that changes the sound. Um, and, and the innovations of different producers and engineers. And then if we, had to, if we got a chance uh, at some point to continue the series, because the series ends around the mid-2000s, um, after that, it would be the internet and how the internet changed hip-hop as hip-hop went to MySpace and SoundCloud and that piff and other mixtape downloading sites and YouTube, you know, like it's always the story of, of technology. So, so all of that to say that affected how I made music because I came into hip hop from the rap side, from the lyrical side, because that's what I could, um, access and practice when I was a little kid. I didn't have access to sampling machines and this sort of stuff. So I really zoned in on what are people doing with words and how are they delivering words? And mm. that became how I, thought about it and how I got into it. And so hip hop evolution taught me, no, this is about technology, embrace all the technology. You know, in hip hop, we have all these debates about, is it cool to use auto tune? Or at least we used to have these debates about, is it cool to use auto tune or not? Or um, all sorts of things. And yeah, it just, it affected how I made the last couple albums. I was, I, I've been manipulating my voice. I've been manipulating all sorts of things because I see that this is the tradition that I'm a, a part of. It's not just a lyrical tradition. It's not just a musical tradition. It's a um, technological tradition. But doesn't that go back to what we were talking about earlier about the impact of technology in our society? You know, like when I said that when the printing press is you know, uh, perhaps it was a poor example. You know, because mm. we were joking around during the uh, during one of the songs that. Our text history is largely debating the printing press, but, the, um, but 
any sort of technology. I mean, I, I hang out with banjo players and fiddle players, who, and we talk a lot about, oh, isn't that great? Our favorite song was recorded around one microphone in 1931 in one take. And that is really cool to it me. Is. That's really, really exciting to me. Yes. But I'm always trying to stop myself when I get too critical of Instagram, when I want to get too critical of Reddit, mm -hmm. when I get too critical of the internet and all these things. I always try to remind myself that, like, Look at all the beautiful things that are happening from it, you know? T totally, totally. And there are absolutely beautiful things that happen with all the technology that we have today, but there's still always the question of what is it serving and who is it serving? Yeah. So Hip-hop was serving yeah, art. Yeah, e exactly. And, and, and how am I using this? So in my, own, in my own case, how am I using this technology to serve the meaning of this song, you know, to serve this audience, to not take away the humanity, but like uh, amplify it. So, Beautiful. yeah, that's how I think about it. Before we go, mm -hmm. can I ask you about Norm? Yeah. The great Norm MacDonald um, passed away a little while ago from when we were taping this. The first time I got to see Norm in real life was when you were guest hosting Q and Norm MacDonald was in studio with you live on the air. Yeah. Give me a memory of Norm. That was that was such a thrill, and I always felt grateful for getting to spend some time with him in conversation, and I just even more so now, you know, that that he's gone because he really is such a special. He really was such a special entertainer and such a special person. I listened to this podcast with um, Norm, uh, sorry, Conan O'Brien and Andy Richter recently, where they're remembering Norm, and that podcast starts with. Conan being like, I just, I can't get to the bottom of what made Norm so special. And I need to spend an hour trying to figure it out. And it really is that way. Like you fall in love with him. I don't know if that's how you feel, but like you actually feel love for Norm. And it's partly because he made, he made you laugh harder than anyone's ever made you laugh. When you're feeling sad. When you're feeling consistently sad. Consistently making you laugh. Just yeah. consistently making you laugh. And the way he does it is so interesting and uh and he is i mean he's just fascinating because he would like like when he was here in the studio to answer your question like he felt so relatable on one hand and so mysterious on the other hand and there's something so charming about that i remember him making me laugh to the point where i couldn't breathe let alone speak at a certain point he launched into this bit about a hypnotist that every time I listen back to it, I'm just like, I didn't know I was setting him up for a bit. It was the one where he said, I like, didn't know. he's doubting hypnotist because if you really did think you were a chicken, yes. wouldn't that break your brain and yeah. every fiber of your being? He goes into this hilarious bit. I forget what we were even talking about. He just made reference offhand to a hypnotist i said like sidebar like what do you think a hypnotist and he launched into this two minute bit that had me unable to breathe he was talking about how we saw a hypnotist once and he made this guy believe he was a chicken and he saw the guy in the parking lot and he was like dude you thought you were a chicken and the guy was like yeah it was cool and i was like how's that cool <laughs> you had a mental breakdown <laughs> you, like, you lost your essence of humanity <laughs> and that's cool <laughs> like you think that's not cool don't pretend like you think that's cool that wasn't cool and then he then he tacked on some other bit about uh how somebody wanted him to see a hypnotist to um kick his smoking habit and he's like well i can't do that because then I, like it just means i have no self-control you know people be like he, i forget how he says it, in his norm way he was like yeah, I'd have to tell people, so the good news is I stopped smoking. The bad news is I have no will of my own. <laughs> Some guy on Bloor Street <laughs> tells me what to do. <laughs> yeah. It was just, like, uh, amazing. And then I learned later um, in looking up Norm interviews and stuff that at a certain point he was trying to write a joke about every single thing so that he could do exactly what happened in that interview. Anybody says anything, and he can have a two-minute bit about it. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, this was this is the kind of commitment he had to his craft. He was literally like, I want to have a bit about pianos, coffee cups, microphones, drum kits, lighting fixtures. Like, so anybody says anything. I mean, isn't that just the greatest talk show guest of all time? He's the greatest talk show guest of all time. 
Uh, and there's just something that I also can't describe that really made you love him. Yeah. Like he was just drop dead hilarious, but then um, he could say the most touching, poignant things too. And he was a master of language. He was just so precise sometimes with his language or imprecise if that's how he wanted to be hilarious. Like he would always say half a hour mm -hmm. just because he knew <laughs> yeah, that was funnier. Even I saw one he said, uh, say if you want to get a pie <laughs> and you want to have a apple pie or, and I don't know why that was funny, exactly. like, but a apple pie was funny to me. Yes. He could be like, if you read his book, he could be so super precise yeah. with language or he could be completely um, silly and playful with it. And, and straight up wrong. I used to always love when he would say, um, when I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you see, uh, when, I, when I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rest in peace, uh, rest in peace, Norm. I think uh, unity, um, I think collectiveness is um, often sadly contrarian these days. And I think this is a beautiful record of a testament to the beauty of unity that we were all taught as we were children. That's a beautiful compliment, Tom. I take that to heart. Shad here in our studio, taking us through some of his favorite songs in his brand new album, Tao, which is out on October 1st.